It's October 24th, 1978, in New London, New Hampshire. The police are on scene at the Chandler Brook Wetland Preserve, responding to reports of a young female body being found. They were not prepared for the carnage they were about to witness. The 27-year-old woman lies there, motionless, void of any trace of life. She had been stabbed over 20 times. Authorities knew they had a murder on their hands, but what they didn't know is they were standing over the very first victim of the Connecticut River Valley Killer, the beginning of a terror that would continue for years to come. Welcome to Find Me in the Dark, a podcast covering all things true crime. This is Episode 10, The Connecticut River Valley Killer. Find me in the dark. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Find Me in the Dark. I'm your host, Eric Phillips, along with my co-host, Robert Prestige. What's going on, guys? So, here we are, guys. Um, episode 10. Uh, we promised that we would do something big for this ep- episode. Um, we promised our listeners that we would do a cold case. And then there was a few votes for uh, Serial Killer. So... We combined them. Fuck it. We did both of them. <laughs> Today we're going to be covering the uh, Connecticut River Valley Killer, which is just a... Man, when we started getting into it, it's such a wild story, dude. Yes, it is. It's just... There's so much to it, and you're going to see that here in a little bit. Um, I would buckle in, because it's going to be a long ride. <laughs> and um, a lot of information, just a lot of stuff that, that are that we had to piece together that you guys can hopefully help us piece together more. Um, and yeah, uh, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a scary case and it's, it's super scary that it's not solved yet. It's, um, but our last release was the movies based on murder Patreon episode. Um, we did bully, which if, uh, you haven't listened to that, uh, please go to patreon.com slash find me in the dark and sign up. It's only five bucks a month and you will get not only that episode, but the entire backlog of micro episodes and wide release episodes. Plus you'll be getting the, uh, <clears throat> the wide release episodes early, yep. which is pretty great. Um, yeah. You got anything Rob? Yeah. Um, I wanted to thank our newest Patreon member, uh, Stacy Jinks. Uh, we definitely appreciate Stacey. your uh, your uh, patronage. Yeah, we yeah. we uh, we love you. We thank you. Um, also, uh, if you guys haven't signed up for uh, our Facebook our group, uh, Find Me in the Dark uh, podcast, right? Find Me in the Dark. Yeah, podcast. find me in the dark podcast. You'll yep. see it. It says fan page on the the profile picture thingy. Yeah, we do a lot of talking with our fans in there, and uh, you know, just different different discru- discussions on our episodes and, and, and things that people want to hear, and you know, just things that are going on. Um, also, if you guys are listening to us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Podbean or pretty much whatever you guys are listening to, all platforms. Do us a huge favor, rate us five stars, and you know, review us. I mean, it, it 
we we were going to constantly say it just because it, it really helps us it helps push us up to where we're going to be able to be listened to by different people yeah you it, know and it it, it, it bumps us up in the charts and yeah. besides signing up for our patreon it's the the best way to support us because like he said um the more ratings we have and the more positive reviews we have it just bumps us up and gets us out to people and that's kind of the main goal of this whole thing so for sure all right rob you ready to get into this or let's, you got anything else let's do it let's hear from laura first so yep that we're definitely doing that <laughs> Find Me in the Dark contains graphic content that may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Catherine Milliken was a beautiful 27-year-old woman born May 25th of 1951 in Newport, New Hampshire. On the afternoon of October 24th, 1978, Catherine went to the Chandler Brook Wetland Preserve in New London, New Hampshire to do some afternoon bird watching. This was the last time she would be seen alive. Her body was discovered the next day, only yards away from where she was last seen. She had over 29 V-shaped stab wounds, majority of them being in the upper body and abdomen. Eyewitnesses on the scene say they spotted Catherine's VW rabbit undisturbed, and some of the witnesses described seeing another gray car in the area, around the same time she was suspected to have been attacked. Mary Elizabeth Critchley was a 37-year-old University of Vermont student, born on Christmas Day in 1943. On July 25th of 1981, a friend of Mary dropped her off on Interstate 91 near the Vermont, Massachusetts border, where Mary then planned to hitchhike to Waterbury, where she had been living with a friend. After Mary's friend dropped her off, she would never be seen alive again. On August 9th of 1981, Mary's body was discovered in the woods near Unity Stage Road in Unity, New Hampshire. Due to the decomposition of the body, the medical examiner was not able to confirm a cause of death. The murders of Mary and Catherine would not be connected for years to come. May 30th, 1984, three years after the body of Mary Critchley was discovered, 16-year-old nurse's aide Bernice Cortmanchi was hitchhiking from Claremont, New Hampshire to Newport to visit her boyfriend. Her family grew worried when neither them or her boyfriend had heard or seen Mary. The family reported her missing the following day. Nearly two years later, on April 9, 1986, her skeletal remains were discovered by a fisherman off Cathole Hill Road in Newport. Forensic examination of her remains uncovered evidence of multiple stab wounds to the neck, along with injuries to the head. July 20, 1984, about two months after the body of Bernice Cortmanchi was found, 27-year-old Ellen Fried who was a supervising nurse at Valley Regional Hospital, decided to take a late-night trip to the local convenience store so she could use the payphone to call her sister. They talked for about an hour, but during the conversation, Ellen noticed a strange vehicle driving back and forth, slowly through the street and parking lot. She was so worried about this mysterious unknown vehicle that she had her sister stay on the phone with her to make sure that her car would start. After starting her vehicle successfully, The two talked for a few minutes until Ellen eventually hung up. The following day, Ellen failed to report to work and was promptly reported missing. The next day, a few miles from where Ellen was last seen, her abandoned car was found on the side of the road. On September 19th of 1985, Ellen's remains were found near the Sugar River in Newport. The autopsy was unable to determine the cause of death due to there only being skeletal remains. But based on the evidence found at the scene, they were able to determine that she had been sexually assaulted and received multiple stab wounds at the time of her death. Well, uh, yeah, man, um, that's a pretty crazy start <sighs> with uh, these women. How many? How many did we just go over? Four. Four, I believe. So yeah, we went over four. Um, one thing that I I think is really because in my opinion, I feel like the the police are kind of behind because they haven't connected to any of these deaths and well there was a large a large gap between those the first two and then then what we're talking about now that's true you know but i feel like i don't know every like there has to be you know they have files on all of these these murders and stuff and you also have to remember there's three there's like three states that pretty much connect like right where this is happening sure. so you know they're they're not working together in as states. You know what I mean. They they have their own separate 
you know, jurisdictions, you know, so I'm guessing that might have something to do with it. I mean, that's just a guess, but yeah, I don't know. Plus you got, you got to take into consideration the, uh, how decomposed the bodies were when they found mm-hmm. them. And then uh, that a, a few of them were skeletons. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have a body that's so badly decomposed that you can't really gather anything from it. And you have a skeleton, which is nothing. Basically it is right. not going to have, you know, it's, and, and, and not only that, there's no eyewitnesses. We have really none. Like if you haven't noticed from us covering this so far, there's a a, la- a lack of what exactly happened to these women, because there's not there's nobody there. Well, and I, and I think that they're. I'm I'm sure they know other things that happen in these crimes, but they're all cold cases, you know. So they don't want to give everything that happened. You yeah. Know? Yeah, and I think with the 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 lack of evidence, it's kind of hard to. Um, like figure out this guy's pattern yeah I you know agree. what i mean because that's a mm-hmm. that's a big thing if they you know if they if they were able to figure out you know th- these these crazy similarities between um these crimes then yeah maybe they could actually start forming a a a, a theory that it's a serial killer right. <clears throat> what would be nice though is if this didn't happen in like the late 70s and 80s and dna actually yeah. meant something back you know because mm-hmm. it's like they have no idea, right? It could it could have, this could have been over? I don't even. I don't well, I mean, know. that's I think that's why. I mean, I mean, so many serial killers thrived in this time, yeah. you know, and just killing in general. I mean, just because it was hard to be caught, big time. I mean, what were we were just talking? What did you just say to me? Oh, I said uh, <laughs> to get caught murdering someone. Um, in the seventies, the cops had to be there when you murdered. Them. Really witness it, and then otherwise they're like, well, you know. I got nothing. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Like I, uh, from this investigation, I've seen that she's been stabbed, and the guy that d- did it, he's not here, so we don't know. Close right. the case. So uh, before we get back into the case and the other murders, let's hear from our friends at History Obscura. Hello and welcome to the History Obscura podcast. This is the place where history's forgotten secrets are unshelved from my vast, firelit book repository and reintroduced to the world. Learn stories of space exploration, medieval royals, smugglers, martyrs, and monsters. Subscribe to History Obscura for a fresh tale every Saturday and Tuesday night. On the morning of July 10th, 1985, 27-year-old single mother, Eva Morris, was seen hitchhiking home from work on Route 12 in New Hampshire. She was never seen alive again. Shortly after she vanished, she was reported missing. Her remains were found on April 25th, 1986 by a group of loggers in Unity, New Hampshire, only 500 feet from where Mary's body was found. The medical examiner determined that she had received multiple stab wounds to her neck. It is the afternoon of April 15th, 1986. 36-year-old Linda Moore was outside of her house, working on her yard by herself. Later on that night, her husband returned home from a hard day at work to find a truly terrifying scene. Linda was lying dead on the floor with multiple stab wounds. There was very clear evidence of a major struggle. Linda did not go quietly. He immediately phoned the authorities. Witnesses in the neighborhood all described seeing a stocky, dark-haired, clean-shaven man with dark-rimmed glasses between the ages of 20 and 25 years old, carrying a blue backpack, trolling the neighborhood in the afternoon. The killer was changing his M.O., taking bigger chances. With this murder and the discovery of Eva's remains, only 10 days later, the police finally realize they have a serial killer on their hands, and he is not finished. Not yet. January 10th, 1987, A 38-year-old nurse by the name of Barbara Agnew was returning home from a group ski trip she went on with a few of her friends. Later in the evening, after Barbara had left for home, a local snowplow operator noticed an abandoned green BMW at a northbound I-91 rest stop in Hartford, Vermont, which is around 10 miles from Barbara's home. The driver's side door was found slightly ajar, and inside, there was blood on the steering wheel. A few months later, on March 28th, Barbara's remains were found near an apple tree. She was wearing ski bibs, a lift ticket, and all around the body, the snow was red with blood. The murders had stopped for over a year. 
the killer seemed to have vanished until the evening of August 6, 1988. 22-year-old Jane Borowski was returning home from a fun day at the county fair in Keene, New Hampshire, when she decided to stop at a vending machine outside of a closed grocery store in Winchester to get herself a beverage. After getting her soda, she was returning to her car, but she couldn't help but notice the Jeep Wagoneer that was now parked next to her. A man exited the Jeep and approached Jane's driver's side window and asked if she knew if the payphone was operational or not. Before she could answer, the man flung the door open and began viciously attacking Jane. He was enraged and screaming incoherent things along the lines of, You attack my girlfriend, and do you have Massachusetts license plates? Jane responded by telling her attacker that she in fact had New Hampshire plates, not Massachusetts plates. Jane was able to break free from the man and run away, but being seven months pregnant, her speed was compromised. He quickly caught up with her and proceeded to stab her 27 times before leaving the scene of the crime, assuming she was dead. Miraculously, Jane crawled to her car, pulled herself into the driver's seat, and drove two miles down the road to her friend's house. While she was driving, she came to a frightening realization. The car in front of her was, in fact, her attacker. Jane made it to her friend's house, and so did the man that tried to kill her. When her friends came out and began to assist Jane, the attacker left, knowing the risk of being caught was much greater with multiple witnesses. Jane was finally able to receive medical attention, where it was found that she had a severed jugular, two collapsed lungs, kidney laceration, and severed tendons in both of her thumbs and knees. Luckily, both Jane and her unborn child survived, though later down the road, her child was diagnosed with a mild case of cerebral palsy. Jane turned out to be a massive help to the investigation. She was able to provide the first three characters of the offender's license plate and provide enough information on his physical appearance to make a composite sketch. The authorities were at a standstill. While Jane was able to give a physical description and a partial plate number, there wasn't much else evidence to go off of. Detectives decided the next step would be to bring in a criminal psychologist by the name of John Philippin to develop a criminal profile. John made multiple trips to the known crime scenes and came to the conclusion that the killer most likely pre-selects the area in which he would kill his victim. He also decided to interview Jane in a state of hypnosis, where she was able to recount her attack in vivid detail. She was able to describe the attacker's Jeep Wagoneer in great detail, including the partial plate beginning with the numbers 662. Police ran a search for the vehicle and plate numbers, finding 350 possible matches, but were never able to pin the crimes on anyone. With the information gathered through his investigation, John was able to complete a criminal profile, Let's take a quick look at what John came up with. 1. Calculated attacks, attention to detail and routine would suggest that he is a collector. 2. Outbursts of rage. 3. Most significant relationship being with his own mother. 4. His father was either absent or abusive. 5. His violence shows that he may be recreating an early traumatic experience. 6. History of voyeurism. 7. Relying on his car and spent a lot of hours on the road. And eight, driving was a form of self-hypnosis. All right, so now we made it through that. We went into his criminal profile, which is pretty interesting, mm -hmm. uh, to, to say the least. I mean, it's really crazy how they can come up with that stuff just by going to the, the, the scenes of the crime mm -hmm. and then just looking at it and be like, this guy's dad was a piece of shit. Yeah. It's like, how it's, did it's you crazy even do that, that dude? And how, you know, like, that makes no sense. Like, man, look at this. There's a girl stabbed there. This guy likes his car. It's like, <laughs> what? Yeah. You know what I found I mean, really... They're, they're, I mean, it seems like they're pretty spot on, though. They, I, mean, it's I think so, too. They always are. Yeah. You know? Um, and I think one of the really interesting things about this... Um, about this case, this cold case serial killer, um, is that a lot of the victims are nurses. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's by accident, or do you think it's he's got to be, like... I really don't. I don't think so either. And I um I mean later we're going to talk about that too, I believe. And yeah, I think we do. Um and I think another thing that needs to be brought up in kind which is weird coming from me in defense of the police not being able to tie these together is the fact that this guy's killing and attacking in different ways. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and different locations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, you know, he's he's escalating in my opinion because 
when he attacks Jane and then leaves, well, that she thinks he leaves, and she gets she crawls in the car amazingly because she's a super strong woman. That's crazy, right? Yeah, it's insane. <laughs> Dude, I stub my toe when I call off work. <laughs> for I'm like, hey, I can't come in today, man. I got a fucking boo-boo. But, you know, then she, she's driving to her house, and this asshole follows her there. Well, he was in front. Right, but but when she goes turns into the house, he's still there. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, her friends come out, are tending to her wounds and everything, and he's just slowly driving past. Yeah, that's, that's, that's insane. Which, in my opinion, not only does it show escalation, but it shows that he might, might be losing control because mm-hmm. he's putting himself in riskier situations. Mm-hmm, for sure. Like, breaking, well, breaking into the house. Right, I was just going to say that. Breaking mm-hmm. into the house, you know... Uh, do and that was Jane, mid. That was midday, and I, th- I feel like most of these were midday. Yeah, it was just crazy to me. Yeah, midday or like early, evening. early evening. Mm-hmm. Like we're talking like six, seven o'clock, some yeah, shit like that's, that. It's nuts, man. And you know, like I said, he's he's taking bigger risks, mm-hmm. and I don't. I think it's it's due to a lack of being able to to control himself. And I think another thing that's really interesting is. When he was attacking Jane, he starts saying stuff like, "You, you, attack my you attacked my girlfriend and stuff like this." And then when you when you put when you put that with the fact that all of the victims are women, it's very evident that this guy hates women. Yeah, yeah. that's really what it is. Mm-hmm. And because usually, if it's like a a, a lust killing or like you know a, a like a, a serial killer that's targeting women because he loves them, there's there's sexual assaults mm-hmm. if he's is if, if he's obsessed in that way but with this there is some evidence of sexual assaults but it's not a consistent thing right i think only one actually only one of the the victims showed sexual assault yeah i, I think it was something I, I mean it's kind of hard to tell with the other ones being skeletons right, you never right. know it could be we could be wrong but you know what in it's crazy i mean i know it's like the 70s and eight, or late 70s and in, in, in 80s but man how many women were hitchhiking in this area? Got to stop. It had to stop. You like, dude, because this is post Ed Ted Bundy. You mm-hmm. know, this is we're talking about like Ed Kemper, fucking Jesus, man. There was so many people that were picking up girls and giving them rides and then bashing them over the head. Or it's just like, come on, man. Like, let's not. It was just not. For, I, just, not. I, don't, I don't get it. I, I don't think I've, I've never. I'm six foot seven, three hundred pounds, and I've never once thought to to hitchhike and jump in somebody else's car like it makes me nervous like no, how you... and every day women uh live with a sense of danger that us as men cannot comprehend right just straight uh, up because i don't have to walk around and worry about someone overpowering me and right. sexually assaulting me like that's just you know it could happen but it's not even cl- i mean every woman has to be careful every single day that they're mm-hmm. out there and make sure which sucks because you know we should be raising our children to respect women and For to sure. keep their fucking hands to themselves. Absolutely. Even if, you know, who cares what she's wearing? Who cares? You know, it's, if she could walk down the street naked and unless she invites you to touch her, you don't fucking touch her. Absolutely. So that's really it. 100%. So yeah, just ladies, if you're listening, please be careful. Um, and then the, the, the fact that they get with under that hypnosis and everything, they get a, a, a serious composite sketch that mm-hmm. if you've seen it, it looks pretty good. Uh, I would assume. And, the the plate numbers you know partial plate number which for a victim that's been stabbed that many times to still get a plate and, number and she's seven months pregnant so you know she's thinking about that too of course and yeah somehow she still is able to she get, has the wherewithal yeah to it's look crazy. at a plate number when she's when she's literally dying yeah you're you're losing consciousness you're you're starting to feel fatigue she vision a severed, is bl- severed jugular yeah yeah like i'm saying on man, top of everything else I'm a fucking hangnail and i'm out of commission <laughs> That's and, crazy. And it's just still not enough, man. They just can't. So they narrowed it down. I mean, how many of those vehicles were there? And let me, you, that's a lot. Yeah. I mean, I don't feel like I've never seen that many. I mean, maybe it's because it's an older vehicle, and but there's, it just doesn't seem like it'd be a super popular car. No. And there's there's more things that I wanted to bring up, actually, with this investigation. And maybe it's because, you know, lack of information being out there. Um, but no, nobody... Uh, looked for shoe prints yeah nobody gathered hairs nobody how about tire tracks dude you know anywhere like nothing nobody drag marks no, you know skip check under their fingernails you know 
none of this stuff. Like, yeah, we and we scoured for information so, and found dude, nothing. Yeah, so much. There was like a website we read where there was like a broken English French guy, French guy trying to say some shit, and I had no idea what he was saying. But there's, you would just think that that information would be out there, and that would be something that the cops are really honing in on. Mm-hmm. But they didn't. No. Nope. So, yeah. You know, the other thing is, you, we already have seven victims, right? Yeah, confirmed, yeah. Confirmed, right. And there's, I mean, there's a, a crap ton of other possible victims, which we're going to get into here very, very shortly. There's going to be an eighth con- f- confirmed victim if you say crap ton one more time. <laughs> right, dude, what are we, fucking eight years old? <laughs> um, and that's not, yeah, we're going to get into the, the possible victims, but that's not even, you got to look at, like, the women that just vanished from that area. That does not mean that they weren't murdered by this guy, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, we're just kind of looking at the same MOs. We're know? looking at the same MO of, of bodies being found in wooded areas or multiple stab wounds, you know, or where the car was seen, mm-hmm. just all those things. But it is important that we cover at least the the best possible cases that are could be connected to right, this. Right. There's, um, there's a lot more, but... We're on a, a certain amount of time, so let's just get into the ones that are, are just r- real good possibilities. Sounds good to me. All right. While we have covered the confirmed victims, that does not mean that those are concrete numbers. Here are some other victims within that time and area that could quite possibly belong to the Connecticut River Valley Killer. On June eleventh, 1968, in Charlestown, New Hampshire, 14-year-old Joanne Dunham was found strangled to death along with evidence of being sexually assaulted. This case is only tied to the Connecticut River Valley Killer due to the geographical location of the scene. If this is in fact a crime committed by the Connecticut River Valley Killer and the description of him in the late 70s and early 80s was correct, he would have been around 15 years old during this time. On October 5, 1982, a 76-year-old woman by the name of Sylvia Gray was discovered in the woods only a few hundred yards from her Plainfield, New Hampshire home a day after she went missing. This is tied to the Connecticut River Valley Killer for similar reasons as the Dunham killing. Sylvia was stabbed multiple times, left in the woods, and lived within the domain of the Connecticut River Valley Killer. On September 19, 1986, The abandoned car of 36-year-old golf pro Sarah Hunter was located at a gas station off Route 7A in Vermont. After the discovery of her abandoned vehicle, Sarah was reported missing. Two months after she was reported missing, her remains were located in the brush on the outskirts of a cornfield located in Paulette, Vermont. She had been strangled to death. Her case was reviewed both by Vermont and New Hampshire authorities and was seen as being a possible victim of the Connecticut River Valley Killer. All right, I have bad news for you guys. This is going to be a two-part <laughs> series because uh, there's just so much information. We don't think we could do it justice just on 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 releasing it in one episode. Right? You know, it just isn't. We would have to shorten a lot of stuff, and it just isn't our style. So we're going to pick up um, two Wednesdays from now mm-hmm. uh, with the second half of the uh suspected this yeah we're going to pick up on this the other suspected victims then we're going to go deeply into the um the suspects mm-hmm. of this murder and there's a few of them that there, there's there's some crazy stuff going on there's some really interesting ones mm-hmm. there's and this this whole story deserves just so much more attention than it actually gets because when i bring it up to people you know um they tell me I need to go to church and stuff like that. No, I'm just kidding. Nobody knows what I'm talking about. And it seems like it's just such a, a this is, you know, this guy killed more people than Zodiac. Mm-hmm. You know, he killed more people than a lot of the, the really famous serial killers. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, I mean, like I said, guys, it's going to be a two part episode. Um, it'll release as scheduled. Uh, we're also going to put out a micro this upcoming uh weekend Mm -hmm. um we're doing another movies based on murder that is correct uh we have picked a movie we're not telling we're not telling anybody (laughs) we're not telling you you're gonna have to pay five five bucks it'll be a good one yeah it's gonna be a good one so let's reiterate this uh go on um patreon.com slash find me in the dark and sign up 
five bucks a month and you will get two extra episodes plus if you know you want those uh, the backlogged episodes around there too so you'll actually get a good amount of episodes i don't know yeah, how many yeah we're getting we're getting up there six seven <laughs> episodes now yeah and then like we said go on um uh whatever platform. your platform you're listening to and rate us five stars and if you're feeling frisky leave a review a positive one i don't want to hear about how you hate us um <laughs> And uh, we will see you guys next week. Yep. Love you guys. Love you guys. Bye.